Well, good morning and welcome. I'm so glad you could join me. If you're online or if you came to a campus, um, we've been working through Psalm 23, and today we come to the conclusion. And it's such an exciting and powerful message that you're going to hear today, because I believe it's the summation of what God has been leading us to. So to start off, wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Yeah, just trust me if you're in your living room. I'm not going to bug you. Close your eyes, and we're going to look at Psalm 23 together. I'm going to read this, and if, if you know it by heart, if you've been memorizing, I want you to just recite it with me wherever you are, if you're in a campus. But I want you to hear the words, not just go through the motions. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How many times have you heard those words said in your life, or how many times have you pondered? Has this perhaps been a study that has opened your eyes to a greater depth? I've titled this series, Ending Dwell, the message for today. I think about dwell. First, we just read about it, this idea of taking up residence with the Lord forever. That's a big word, forever. (laughs) That's a long time. It's mind-blowing, forever, eternity. But also dwell, as I was looking at that, I, I realized dwell also means like to think about to dwell on something or to speak about it or, or to write about it, to keep my focus on. And, and really dwelling with forever encompasses not only a location of where I get to be, but what I will get to do. I get to dwell on the things of the Lord for eternity. And so I ask a question, why are you here? Why did you get dressed and drive in a car, perhaps, or walk to a campus? Why did you turn on your computer or click on a tab or open up a phone? Why are you here? Are you hoping maybe that that I'll speak a, a new word to you today? You'll learn something new. Or maybe that you'll hear a truth that you hope somebody sitting next to you, elbow, elbow, is waiting to hear, that you think, ah, they need to hear this. Maybe you're hoping for a good story or just you needed some relationship today if you're gathered with some people. Maybe you were hoping there was a song played or you just couldn't wait for that music. My goal today is that you would worship. And usually when you hear worship, you think, well, I think we just did that, right? We sang some songs. And I said, no, my hope is today you will worship, that you will have revelation of the goodness of God and mercy of the shepherd. We started the series and there was this crazy picture of this sheep named Chris. And I bring to you a different sheep, Barak. And Barak has the same problem that Chris did. And if I had smell vision right now, you would turn off any device or leave any room that you are attending. Because I could imagine the odor that comes from this sheep would be rather strong. <laughs> I think it the he has 75 pounds of wool hanging on him. His eyes are covered. There's debris under his eyelids. There's ulcers that have formed. He's underweight, even though he looks ginormous. He's got feces in his matted hair and smells of urine. This is Barak. This is the life without a shepherd. This is what happens when we go into the world and we choose to be led by the world. How are you being led? 
You see, our message today is about a shepherd. And the first word that I want to draw to your attention is before we get to the summation of this psalm, I think we better go back and understand what this psalm is about. And the first word I come to is my, my shepherd. Is the Lord your shepherd is the question. David, the psalmist made it clear. It's not just God out there. He is my shepherd. Is that true for you? Is the Lord your shepherd? There's several things that must be in place for this to be true. Let's look at a couple of them. First, my shepherd means that I acknowledge there is God. God does exist. And when I, when I take this Bible and when I read this word, I believe and I trust that this is God's word. And the very first opening, if you opened your Bible right now to Genesis, and the first thing it says is, in the beginning, God. So for the statement, my, to take place, something has to happen. I have to submit to God. I have to acknowledge God. Second, I have to acknowledge that he is father, father of all, creator, creator of all, all things, That he breathes everything into existence with just a whisper. And that he is my savior. And as we go into the Christmas season, he is Emmanuel, God with us. As Jesus came in the form of a baby born in a manger, the savior arrives. That my means that God is all strength and protector. And ultimately, if I can submit to that, he is my shepherd. And the scripture tells us it's very simple. That I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that he is Lord. And I am saved and he becomes my shepherd. So, is Jesus my shepherd? Is he your shepherd? This must take place for the rest of the psalm to even matter. If he's not your shepherd, if you're wondering and wrestling, I'm glad you're here. Please keep listening. But the fact is, everything from this moment forward rests on that statement. Is he my shepherd? The next word I want to talk about is he. You see, he is all-encompassing. And as you've studied and listened and perhaps memorized the psalm, as you listened a few moments ago, he was a resounding theme. You see, he is the one who makes me lie down in green pastures. It's he who does that because he knows what's best for me. When my boys were little, I would make them lie down in bed. They needed a nap and dad needed a break. So I make them lie down and it was good for them and and, and our, our shepherd, he makes us, he leads us. If we want to be led, if we're willing, he will lead us into those places of refreshment and res- restoration of my soul. And he guides. But importantly about guiding is he guides me on his paths for his name's sake, not for ours, so that he would receive all glory. But if we follow and we live in his good pasture, if we allow him to shepherd us, that his name is glorified. He's the one who comforts. It's his comfort. It's his comfort. He's the one who prepares the table before the enemies. Will we sit with him and dine? He does all this work. He's the one who anoints my head with oil, or as we learned last week, who supplants the very spirit of God in me when I say yes to him. Please, be my shepherd, be my savior. And ultimately, it's he that joins us in the walk that we get to be a part of. And Ephesians, if you want to write this down, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Just write that down for a second. Go back and look at that. Here's the essence of of it. It's his grace that has saved me through faith not of my own doing, it is a gift of God. The ability for me to even say, my shepherd is a gift. It's his grace that has saved me. 
all along you see, wow, for my to be possible, he must be at work. <laughs> for, for my shepherd to be my cry, he must do these things. And then we get to Psalm 23, 6. If you want to open your Bibles there, get your app open, or maybe you just open your mind because you've already got it memorized. Listen to what it says. It says, surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man. You know, the problem with the end of the psalm is that so many people want to skip verses 1 through 5 and want to get only to Psalm 23, 6. I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to people in the midst of loss. And it's pretty clear that they don't have a shepherd. Well, the world is their shepherd, but the shepherd is not a part of their life that we're talking about. And, and this statement frequently comes up. Oh, it's a really hard day, but they're in a better place. They're in a better place. The reality is that Psalm 1 23, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 say, for this to take place, for Psalm 6 to take place, 23, 6, excuse me, for that to take place, everything before it must be established. If I want the goodness and mercy of God to follow me all the days of my life, he has to be my shepherd. If I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, he has to be my guide. I can't just jump to it and say, yeah, I like the idea of eternity with you. I'm not so sure about the now. The key word in the beginning of Psalm 23, 6 is surely. This is a word of confidence. The author David, through his life experience, as he writes, he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Like, I have experienced you in the valley. I have sat at your table that was presented even in the midst of my enemies. You have led me. You have made me rest. You have restored my soul. And surely with confidence, you will continue the work you started. Is that true for you? Do you have confidence that God's mercy and goodness will and continue to follow you? Let's focus a little closer. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Even though the word is your, the highlight word is his. Sorry, is his. The highlight word is his. It's his mercy and his goodness. Look what King David says in the Psalms. Uh, go to Psalm 25, and he says this. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from old, like forever. <laughs> Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness. O oh Lord, let your goodness shine as you remember me. You see, it is his goodness. It's his mercy. And let's look closer at goodness for a moment. What do you mean his goodness? Here's a few thoughts. Ponder these ideas. One, God's holiness. His goodness is a reflection of his holiness. That is a word that is so full of so much meaning, but let's try to get it boiled down to the basics. Holy means he has nothing uh, of evil in him. He is perfect. He has no sin in him. He is 100% honest and truthful, he cannot lie. He is holy, untouchable, unapproachable, holy. And yet, through Christ, we are given relationship directly to our holy God. And his goodness is reflected in his holiness. His moral ethic, his, the morality of God is given to us. You know, he says he writes in our hearts things like, we just know when things are wrong and what is right, what is good and what is evil. And his, his ways are perfect. And if you could possibly live them out perfectly, you would find that 
you would be so <laughs> aglow of his goodness because of his moral virtues. They're just good and right and true. And then, of course, perfect. Perfect and holy kind of are the same. I kind of threw that in there. And I thought, well, but everything he does is perfect. It's done in exactly the way it should be, even if for us it doesn't look like it. What about his kindness? That even when I was an enemy of God, he still loved me. His kindness. And he's upright. And his justice, uh, his justice, he is the perfect judge. He is upright in all of his decisions. There's no shadiness in him. And so, as the psalmist says, surely your goodness will follow me. All of these attributes of you continue to be shepherding me, guiding me, and a part of me if I draw close to you. And I benefit from these things. And the second one, of course, is his mercy. His mercy. Mercy is a loaded word again. It's so much involved in it. Mercy. The first one I chose was, I think, the obvious. Forgiveness. See, God doesn't have to forgive, but he desires it. He desires that none would perish. And out of his mercy, he extends forgiveness to each one of us. And because of that, it exhibits mercy through his loving kindness toward me. And his affection, his sincere affection, his desire to live in intimate relationship with his creation. And I love this word, steadfast love. It's that idea that it's unwavering. That on the days when, man, I pretty much, uh, if, if I had to, you know, go in front of the court of law, they would say, man, you're a mess. <laughs> what is going on? And God says, yeah, but I still love you. My love is steadfast. My love doesn't shake because you make a poor choice. When I said on the cross, as Jesus hung there, he says, it is finished. It said, it's finished. It's done. You're not going to persuade something different because of some behavior you exhibit. He says, my love is steadfast. My mercy is rich. And of course, the promise. His mercy is enveloped in a promise of complete forgiveness for all eternity. What a gift. And then, of course, his faithfulness to us. God is faithful. He is faithful to finish what he starts. He is faithful that what he says is true will be proven to be true. He is faithful to say, I will love you all the time, despite what you did, what you've done, or what you think you might do. My love is for you, my affection. It's his mercy. It's his mercy. Jonathan Edwards was one of these guys back in the 1700s, a theologian, and he just, he writes it this way, and he may make you feel a little bit, I don't know, small, but that's okay. Think about his words. He says, God is pleased to show mercy to his enemies. He's pleased by that. According to his own sovereign pleasure, he finds pleasure in extending mercy. Though he is infinitely above all and stands in no need of creatures, yet he is graciously pleased to take a merciful notice of poor worms in the dust. Now, I don't think God sees you as a poor worm But I think the point is that in comparison to his majesty, his grandness, his holiness, we are but worms in the dust. And he cares for us and he cares for you. He's your shepherd. And his mercy is such a gift. The last focus of the day is I. Now, I struggled even bringing this one in for a moment, and then I realized, well, that's the point. You see, if I is the only point, then that's a problem, because if it is, then everything is about me, I. 
So what's the responsibility? See, before I jump into that passage, the last part, here's the responsibility. One, what must I do? Sorry, I skipped it. I must surrender. I must surrender to the Lord if he's going to be my savior too. I must obey. I must learn to obey and live in the life that he's trying to lead me in. I must commit. I've got to be more and committed to what God has for me. Listening carefully, but his leading to his leading, listening to his spirit. I must trust him. I must trust that the path he wants to take me on is actually better. (laughs) I must trust him. I must love him. Not because it's a command, although he does say, love God with the Lord of all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but I must genuinely love him. And ultimately, my response is that I give. That I give of myself, of my time, of as he pours into me and I am filled with his compassion for others, that I love others. As he fills me with abundance, that I'm generous in my giving, in my time, in my service. Oftentimes people hear giving and they go, ah, no, my ability to give resources financially to support the work of the kingdom is a blessing for me. Because it's a relationship with my shepherd that I'm contributing to. That as I surrender what I think is mine, which is all his, by the way, it's all his. And he graciously gives us abundance. And then he says, would you give it back? How much? How generous would you be? I'm called to be generous. And so Psalm 23 says this. Verse six, the second half. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If I surrender, if I learn to live in obedience with him, if I build deep relationship with my shepherd, all of these things, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But here's the catch. Many of you are focused on forever and you don't realize or you haven't realized or you have forgotten Forever begins now or yesterday or 30 years ago. At the moment you said, my Savior, at the moment you asked, God, please be my leader. I submit to you. God, I surrender to your Lordship. At that moment, your eternity begins forever. That's why I began with the word dwell. See, as I'm living today, I get to dwell on his goodness and his mercy. And I get to dwell on, on his leadership. I get to think about it. I can write about it. I get to ponder it. But there's also this promise. And this is where I rest. And I don't know how you feel, but there are days where I think I definitely am ready to dwell in the house of the Lord. Yes, he is dwelling with me, but I am so looking forward to dwelling with him in his presence away from this world and the mess of it. And Jesus says this regarding what you invest in, in Matthew. And he's talking to the disciples and he says this. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The fact is I'm building and working on a relationship so that my treasure is with me today and I will dwell forever with him in eternity. It's just, I don't know, it's mind-blowing. I just ask you to pause and worship on that idea. Worship him for that truth. It carries me in the difficult days, through the valleys. I ponder it as I lay by the streams, as I'm filled by his goodness and mercy, as I dine at the table he set before me. I look forward to the day when I will be with him forever. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. It's worth the investment. 
remember Barack? There's, there's Barack, and Barack is doing well. Look at how much better he looks. Of course, he's got some problems. He's got to figure out how to live with other sheep again, and, and they say he's doing well in that. And, and I thought, you know, the difference between Barack and us is that Barack is going to be perhaps content where he is. I'm not sure that he's pondering his decisions in life. <laughs> I wonder if, you know, is he sitting around going, boy, that maybe wasn't such a good idea to take off. Uh, that hair was really heavy. <laughs> it was a serious burden. But see, the problem with I, the statement I, I started with, is that if I is the only thing that I care about, if dwelling in eternity is the only focus I have, then I'm afraid that we've missed out. Take you to Philippians, if you want to open your Bible to Philippians 1, chapter, chapter 1. Paul is writing, and I love his phrase because I feel so much the weight of what he's saying in relation to the statement, dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here's what he says. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, to dwell in the house forever. For that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He's torn. Do you feel that way? Like I long for dwelling forever in the house of the Lord, but I know there's a purpose beyond that. And listen to what he says, the second part here. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Psalm 23 leads us in a great passage of acknowledging our shepherd, of verifying his guidance, his leading, and his direction, and with confidence stating that there will be a day that I will rest with him forever, that I'll dwell in his presence. But what if it's just you? What if you're the cul-de-sac of Psalm 23? I think that we need to strive to see ourselves on mission. And Paul makes it clear. He says, I desire to be in the dwelling place of the Lord. I would much rather be with Christ. He says, but I see that there's a purpose. So my hope is that you will live in such a way that the thought of dwelling forever is motivation. And you have confidence that God's goodness and mercy follows you, that he leads you as his shepherd. But all of that is with the purpose for you that he has today, that others might know of this good shepherd. He's my shepherd. I hope he's yours. I'm going to hand off to the campuses and let them take it from there. Thank you for joining us wherever you're watching from.